It is just a huge honor today to be podcast interviewing Peter S. Evans, MS, DDS, MAGD, all the way from Williamsburg, Virginia. Peter Evans is a practitioner, author, speaker, national dental coach, and a founding member of the American Academy for Oral Systemic Health. He is the president of the Biocompatible Dentist, a company that provides education and resources for dentists about whole body dentistry. Dr. Evans' expertise lies in his ability to research and bring innovative solutions to the emerging evolution of dentistry to include whole body care and create value. As creator of the multimedia educational resource for dentists, the new patient grid, the five-step formula workshop, Dr. Evans has helped dental offices across the country and abroad increase their efficiency, patient care, productivity, and prosperity through his training. Peter, um, guys like you and me, who are older dogs that have their MAGD, congratulations on getting their, your MAGD. Uh, I got mine. I think that was the single best decision I ever, ever did. It, uh, you know, it, it put you in a group. They say you're a summation of your five best friends. Yeah. And the next thing you know, you know, you're in Phoenix. There's a gazillion dentists, but everybody that was going to these AGD meetings to get their FAGD and their MAGD, it was fun to hang out with a group of dentists who were just going for it. And uh, that was a big influence of why I started Dental Town. Because, I mean, most dentists after work, they go home and disconnect and turn on ESPN and drink beer. But who are these, you know, 25,000 dentists who will go to Dental Town and read more um, till all hours of the night? But, um, so <clears throat> when I got out of school in 87, I never heard oral systemic health. I never heard that the mouth was connected to the body. When, when did this all come about? Uh, for me, when it all came about was back in the 90s. Um, I had a couple of patients that were seeing an oncologist in a, uh, in a town very close, Norfolk, Virginia. Uh, There's an oncologist and his views of um, how powerful the mouth was. In, in, in his profession. So uh, he was, I think for 17 years, named Vincent Speckhart, Dr. Speckhart. He was the uh, uh, director of the cancer clinic at the Paul Hospital in, in uh, Norfolk. And uh, he th knew that he was killing some of his patients with chemotherapy and radiation and wanted to have some kind of alternative uh, care for them also. So, um, my story all started with him. And the more I learned, uh, the more I just wanted to find out about whole body dentistry, what's happening with uh, periodontal disease. You know, uh, uh, before we got on, you'd ask me about my master's degree in, in microbiology and immunology. You know, that was before I went to dental school. And I had stopped three or four months short of, of uh, my PhD research. But it was all in, in immunology and, and, and how the body's defenses uh, uh, react to infections and disease. And, you know, that fit right in with perio. You know, it fit with the host and, uh, response, these kind of things. So all this stuff started fitting together. And I took it further to say that, you know, what we do in the mouth impacts whole body health. Whether we kind of are taught that in, in, in the beginning of dental school and how we present it to our patients. So... All of that kind of surrounded me, and I, I finally figured out that, you know, our new patient examination um, doesn't deal with whole body health because uh, we were never taught that in school. You know, our, our what we taught for the new patient examination was like we're gonna we're gonna memorize the treatment plan so we can present it to the uh, patient to to uh, teach them how we're gonna fix their teeth, and. What we've learned now is I think that we can we can uh, include the patient <laughs> in the process of what we want to do for them. And so uh, I developed uh, over the past 10 years, been working on this just for myself. And um, it I think it struck me maybe about two years ago. I got a, I got a notice from Care Credit where they tell you, hey, you know, the top 10 uh, practices in your uh, zip code sent in this much money and uh, they got out of out of this many people and this is what you did last quarter so you know don't you want to have more care credit people sign up for more care credit and I looked at the figures and I thought I thought wait a minute here's like set I forget what Howard I forget what the numbers were specifically but it was like Here's 13 practices or, or, or 17 practices, and they were able to pass like $240,000 through 
um, care credit. And then they had my figures. You know, I had like seven people go through care credit, but they signed up for like fifty-two or $62,000. And I thought, no, wait a minute, that doesn't make sense. So I went back and calculated out says, if they had 72 people that did $241,000, how much was that per person? And I looked at mine and said, wait, wait a minute, I do seven times that. I do seven times what they're doing. And they're the top 10 in my zip code area. I said, you know, care credit ought to find out what I'm doing, you know, and talk to their people. So my average case average is, is like, you know, is beyond the national average. I, 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 one of your podcasts a while back, you were you were talking to Kristen um, Pelletier, is that her name? And, and and you guys had said something about national averages. Uh, the average new patient average value was like four hundred thousand um, dollars, something in that range. And my average new patient value just is like crushes that, but it's because of my new patient appointment. So that was one of the things that we wanted to talk about how I bring somebody into the practice, diagnose with more of the seven diagnostic disciplines. Um, that's probably the big difference that I could bring to the table for the young guys right now. Well, I'll tell you um, the, the reality, you know, like, you know, you'll, you'll podcast someone in TMD and they have this extensive workup, but I have to time them out and say, okay, the reality is 85% of the people, if someone has TMD, all they do is pop an upper impression and make a, make a night guard. The yeah. reality right now is the new patient exam for probably 80% of Americans includes the cleaning. They come in, they pop some bite wings, uh, they go right into the cleaning. I mean, they do a cleaning exam, x-ray, new patient exam, and most of them schedule an hour. And if you're lucky, you work for somebody that m maybe give you an hour and a half to where they see the dental assistant first to get the x-rays and then they go right to the cleaning and then the doctor comes in and does a new patient exam. What, what would you, do you, what do you think of that, um, that approach? Well, um, or, or the, specifically, what do you think of the new patient exam, including the cleaning? Just a wham, bam, thank you, ma'am. Yeah, I think you, I think that there's, uh, there's offices out there that run their practice, um, on high volume. I mean, they want 20, 30, 40 uh, patients a month. And um, at that point, my model as, as a, the, uh, like a proof of concept model, um, if I had uh, 10 patients a month, because I, I, I work three days a week, so 10 patients uh, a month for me is like a, a new patient every single day. And that's, that's, that's about as much as I want to work up. But as a proof of concept, this is a good model for it. Uh, we've got a coaching client out in uh, California right now that, that sees like 150 new patients a month. And that's their model is come in, get a cleaning, uh, get to the hygienist quick, do the photographs, do the, do the bite wings. But what we've got with them is they can sub section out the patients that might be interested in learning more about how their dentistry is going to impact their health and subset that out instead of running everybody through that. It's like having a specialist in your office where you know, you've know you got a four dentist office, you got a perio guy that comes in, you got an oral surgeon guy that comes in, you got an endo guy that comes in. You could separate out patients, if you ask the right questions, you could uh, separate out those patients and say, you know, I'd be interested. You know, my sister in Tulsa got all her mercury fillings out or, or is feeling better now that her perio is all, you know, she's got more energy now that the infection is gone from her body. Um, you, could have a, you could have a subsection in your own office that would specialize in these people could be $10,000 cases, $28,000 cases, not just the average of what, what you know to be is like, you know, $1,000 per patient. That's why they need 50 new patients a month. Um, so it's, it's a preference for the dentist is, and we get this all the time, is that people say, you know, Peter, I've been thinking about, you know, maybe being more natural in my practice and maybe, you know, I'm already mercury free. I, I don't do, I don't put mercury fillings in, but, you know, I remove them every single day, you know, so I've been thinking, they said, what's going on with that? And they say, uh, it'd be a great idea, but I don't know where to start. You know, we weren't taught this in dental school. Uh, we don't have the verbal scripts and the verbal skills. To, uh, to lay it down for our staff right away. So uh, that started years ago for somebody needs to know where to begin. 
to, to include this in their practice. And when they know that there are certain patients out there, a certain population of their practice, um, that might be looking for something that fits in better with their own lifestyle of, um, you know, getting fit, getting healthy, buying organic. There's a certain large percentage of the American population of adults that are going in that direction. So why wouldn't, as dentists, uh, offer a style, a style of dentistry that would uh, complement their lifestyle? So I, I, I'm seeing this just as a groundswell right now. So talk us through, if, if they go to your website, it's called thebiocompatibledentist.com. So let's start with the basic. What is a biocompatible dentist? Um, biocompatible dentist, to me, it means we are, we are working inside of um, uh, materials for the office that some of them are more biocompatible than others. We've got um, titanium is a fairly biocompatible metal. Uh, mercury may not be. Uh, plastics with BPA have been in the news for two or three or four years that are that are uh, um, uh, on people's minds. We use uh, rexilium and beryllium and all these others. And those dissimilar metals, um, and I can maybe I can approach it like this because I think the mouth is the most powerful place on the body. It's my own personal opinion. So when we start putting dissimilar metals in the mouth, each one of those has an electromagnetic uh, radio, uh, 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 what's it called? Penumbra, I forget what it's called. Electromagnetic In radiation or? Yeah, yeah, there's a circumference like the Earth. It's got, a, you know, the electromagnetic, it gives us our atmosphere. Everything on the planet's got an electromagnetic radius. So, and they all interact. So if the mouth is so powerful, and that's what I believe, because you've got um, periodontal disease, uh, the most prevalent chronic inflammatory disease on the planet. You've got uh, breathing, can't do without that. You've got teeth. Any mammal, any mammal that loses their teeth uh, dies, except for humans. That's how that's how important teeth are. You've got uh, kissing, emotional. You've got tasting, one of the one of the senses. You've got uh, the acupunctural meridians pass through the mouth, the only place on the body where all of the acupunctural meridians pass through. You've got a third of the cranial nerves that exit the brainstem go to the lower third of the face. So, I mean, we're not talking about, you know, your liver or your left elbow or anything like that. The lower third of the face is, is, is why is the brain so interested? Why is there so much going on here in the lower third of the face? So, um, I think that maybe we should start looking at the biocompatibility of the materials that we're placing in the mouth, and we could be uni more uniform in that. There's even now places that we can go to to test for the biocompatibility of the materials we put in people's mouths. So to answer you, it's not so much, um, it's a word that I just um, thought that that would be better than calling it biological dentistry or alternative dentistry or complementary dentistry or holistic dentistry or all the words that are thrown out there. Because uh, some of those have like bad connotations. So as far as dentists are concerned, we understand, well, we're working with materials. We love to do that. So the biocompatible dentist might be somebody who pays attention more to the materials that they're placing in the most powerful place on the body. So that's where that came from. So, um, you know, a lot of dentists um, badmouth holistic uh, dentists. I mean, they just they just think it's uh, great crazy. But then when you watch them post on Dental Town, they're extremely holistic, like, Dentists don't want to treat their uh, high blood pressure with a pill. They want to lose weight and exercise. They, they don't want to go to a statin. They want to change your diet. It's like, it's like every dentist's comment is anti big pharma, um, you know, the, the, you know all, all the, everything. But then, you, but then when some dentist says, well, I'm alternative or holistic, they're like, oh, you're a quack. It's, yeah. like, it's like, dude, all, all your comments are you're holistic. You, you just, it's just a word that uh, um, plays with their mind. Dude, I, I, I see, um, I, I saw um, periodontist, uh, I, I think of all the nine specialties in my 30 years, I, I celebrate my 30 year graduation from dental school this May 11, um, periodontist um, of the nine specialties um, had the most change. And I saw this pendulum where people were getting away from uh, quadrant surgery, everything, just going right to extracting teeth and going to titanium. I see now um, that pendulum coming back because a couple of emotions. Number one, treat other people like you want to be treated. 
these dentists are realizing, well, if I had a purgation involvement, I wouldn't want to pull my molar. I'd try to save my tooth. Yeah. And number two, these implants have a much higher failure rate. We know that the industry's told us it's a 5% failure rate. It's probably closer to 20. And then you probably have another 20% with just chronic peri-implantitis. So yeah. I, I think periodontal therapy um, is coming back um, in full swing. I think uh, I, I hear it all the time from dentists that they're now, you know, putting the brakes on going right to extracting uh, furcation involvements and going to titanium and they're, they're trying to save teeth. Well, what, what are your thoughts? I mean, you, you, you've seen the periodontists under influx in your career as much as I have. Uh, I, yeah, I see the periodontist as, as the foundation of what we're trying to do if we're going to save teeth. Um, extracting teeth that got furcation involvements uh, doesn't seem to be, uh, I mean, as, as, a, as a wholesale <laughs> idea, doesn't seem to be a good idea. But now, when it, when it comes to taking whole body dentistry, just getting rid of, of the causal agents is one of the things. So if you think that, that you can't keep that tooth clean enough, and as that's a causal agent to, to, to damage uh, the rest of your whole body health, um, then that might be something that the patient wants to consider getting that tooth out. But that's just one of the seven diagnostic disciplines on the table. So you've got, you've got periodontal, uh, periodontal disease, you've got the, the restorative care that we, that we use, and, and I would say like use biocompatible materials. You've got uh, cosmetics and ortho that help with structural and, and emotional health of the patient. You've got TMJ, uh, temporomandibular dis disorders. Uh, you've got occlusal disease now on the table. You've got sleep apnea on the table that we can diagnose, and you've got pathology and infections like osteonecrosis of the jaw or failing root canals or whatever, because there's more infections, and you, you know this, there's more infections in, in the jaw than any other bone in the whole body. So um, those seven diagnostic disciplines kind of uh, take into effect whole body dentistry. So I'd, I'd, periodontal, periodontal disease, I think, is the foundation we must uh, observe, but occlusal disease is number three on the table right now as far as destroying tooth structure and uh, people not knowing that they have it, and that's tied into sleep apnea now that people are talking about, well, what about GERD? What about acidity in, in the mouth? What about uh, nighttime bruxism? And all this is, is turning into whole body dentistry very quickly when you take a look at what's happening with the body and how it reflects in the oral cavity. And what do we do about it as dentists? How can we diagnose it and help our patients live a longer life, healthier, with the least amount of problems? So, so, so for you, it's exactly seven, and you put them in order. They're weighted in order. So, no, one no I'd put, I'd put, I'd put occlusal disease up towards the top, probably more. I mean, it's a, it seems like an Howard. It seems like an epidemic. Too, you know, come in here, everybody's clenching and gritting their teeth. So, um, so, so your seven again, go through, because I wrote down, uh, I, my list was nine. So, so go through. Oh, through yeah, there are. Seven. So I, I, I group a little bit of, of, of cosmetic and ortho together only because uh, it seemed logical to me. And I grouped pathology and infections together just because it seemed like it should go. So, so go through the seven again. So that's uh, periodontal disease, okay, periodontal. Our, our restorative concerns with biocompatible materials. Third is cosmetics and ortho. You know, we're dealing with the emotional well-being of the other patients with those things, too. Um, third is temporomandibular disorders. Oh, Fourth oh, is oh thir third is TM temporomandibular disorders. So restorative includes cosmetics and ortho? No, restorative uh, is second. Third is uh, cosmetic and ortho. Okay. Fourth would be temporomandibular disorders. Okay. Uh, it's lifestyle changing for sure. Uh, occlusal disease is five. Six would be sleep apnea. Seven would be... Uh, kind of pathology of infections grouped together. Okay. So I think, I think we've, if we diagnose with those in mind, you get whole body health, you get case size that is uh, uh, more than $400 per patient. But how do you relate that to the patient to accept what you're saying? And okay. that, comes, that comes with a whole different conversation. Okay, I, I want to back up because I, I, I feel like I know my homies pretty well. I mean, I've been watching them post on Dental Town at least four hours a day since 1998. I'm out there in the field lecturing a lot. Um, th th this is the number one thing guys like you can do that the majority can't. They just flat out tell you, 
Dude, I don't like to sell dentistry. I, I, did, I didn't go to school eight years to be a salesman, and you're telling me to sit down and sell all this stuff, and I, I don't want to do it. They, they, they'd rather just sit in the chair and have you say, this tooth broke, can you fix it? They're like, yeah, I'll crown it. Or this tooth hurts, can you fix it? Yeah, I'll root canal and crown it. They just believe deep down inside that guys like you um, are, you, 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 you love to sell. And they think it's a four-letter word. That's what we're dealing with. We're dealing with introvert people with an undergraduate degree in science. I got it. And that's what I was a long time ago. And I, because I hate selling too. So this is why I took the path to get more education on communications and uh, psychology, things like that. And so part of what I've done is develop uh, uh, an entire program called the New Patient Grid. And that includes a, a five-step formula that you can take the patient from the first telephone call to the last agreement where they agree to accept treatment. And part of that is understanding how you get the patient to accept your best treatment. So uh, there's something I've developed called the top 10 new patient questions. And those go through every step of the way, and you, you can follow the formula. It's actually, you need another piece of paper? Yeah. <laughs> are you gonna go, are you gonna go, you said it's a 10 what? The, the, the top 10 new patient questions. Are you gonna go through those? I'd love to hear those. Oh man, I, uh, we don't have an hour, but I can go through them real quick. Just, I, let, these, let, let your guys know that something's out there that they've never, they've never seen before. But it all has to do with applied psychology and the behavioral sciences. And those were thought, you know, when we went through school, those those weren't out in the public anymore. They were academic things. Behavioral sciences were you did your studies and you did it in it, it wasn't out in the world, but it is now. The Internet's got everybody being their own uh, health advocate. I mean, they're looking these things up and you've got to bring in some psychology uh, into your dental practice. So, yeah, I can go through those top 10 questions and I can blitz through them just so they know that something's out there besides pick up the explorer, pick up the mirror, and start examining. So yeah, you want me to go through that right now? Yeah, if you want to. Yeah, let me do that. So part of this is to distinguish and differentiate, differentiate yourself right at the get-go. So um, if you bring the patient in, first of all, um, you don't pick up the mirror and explore immediately. You pick up a pen and your cheat sheet, and I always just say, well, you know, uh, uh, hey, Julie, you're at the dentist today. You know, how can I help you? And then you stop and you listen. So you write these things down, too. You're always writing these things down. Um, and now they say, well, you know, I'm here just for cleaning or I'm here just for my because my insurance is going to run out. Well, you kind of know what kind of patient you're getting. But if you've got a patient that says, listen, I said, you know, uh, my gums have been bleeding or my sister's had all her mercury out. And I've been thinking about this. My my the, my mother had uh, my mother had uh, Alzheimer's and uh, uh, I'm not I, you know, blah, blah, blah. You know, whatever's running through their mind, you want to know. Um so after that, the second question I ask is, well, so, so what kind of dentist are you looking for? And they don't even know what to do with that question because they think all of us are the same. So they might come and they say, well, you know, I'm just here to get my teeth clean. Well, this is the intel you need to find out your, the wants and the needs of your patient. Or they may say, hey, I've been looking online. Uh, I'm thinking uh, all these uh, what you read about, you know, plastic fillings and mercury fillings, and I've been thinking about that myself. So it just kind of gives you the intel to guide yourself on the on the on the path. Uh, so the third question comes in after they've explained uh, what kind of dentist they're looking for. You you just casually say, you know, have you have, ever had any bad experiences at the dentist? Okay, all, now every single one of these reasons we don't have time to go into every single one of them, but. I ask that question as number third because I want to know what kind of pain they've gone through. So they explain, well, yeah, my child dentist never used Novocaine or something like that. And they tell you a horror story or they tell you, no, I've never had any problems. I'm okay with the dentist. So the fourth question would be directly after that. I sit back in the chair after they tell me a bad thing that happened to them. Now, again, 
This is all applied psychology. Every step is like breadcrumbs leading them to the next strategy. Can you see it? Yes. Okay. So the fourth question is, is that, well, let me ask your advice that uh, Leslie, you know, what makes a good dentist? You know, in your eyes, what makes a good dentist? And they'll say, well, nobody's ever asked me that before, you know? Well, I need a dentist that is, uh, you know, somebody's going to be honest with me, you know? Somebody's going to be painless. Somebody who's knowledgeable, knows what they're doing, you know? And sometimes my assistants in the, in the, in the, in the operatory with me at that time, you know, I'll stop right there. I said, oh man, we were doing so good right up to that knowledgeable thing. You know, I, I was, I was okay. Uh, and that gets a chuckle out of them every time. But right after that, I will say something like, um, and this is all written out in, in, the, in the new patient grid, actually. I'll say something, Leslie, I said, no, I'm just joking. I said, you know, the three things you just told me, I will make sure that we do every one of them. Is that okay with you? And so those three things that were important for her, you know, be honest, be gentle, be knowledgeable. I just immediately, and this is a little applied psychology and it's a little bit, I'm going through it quick, but the patient, I say, the three things that were just important to you right there, I'm gonna make sure that we do them for you in this office, you've reached a very good office. So in this process, you immediately start to build trust in an instant, just like that. Doesn't take you three weeks to build trust with this patient. These verbal scripts and skills and this applied psychology lead you into those stages. So after that, when I say, what makes a good dentist? I want your advice. Well, once somebody gives you their advice, they've got a little bit more vested interest in, in, in you adhering to their advice too. So you say, Leslie, you know, these three things that you mentioned, we're gonna do every one of them for you. Would that be okay with you? And obviously she says yes. And then I say, well, so what do you want to accomplish? Immediately, what would you like to accomplish? In our work together, what would you like to accomplish? Now these verbal scripts, very intentional. Howard, all of my verbal scripts, very intentional. So when I say, you know, Leslie, in our work together, what do you want to accomplish? So when I say that, I've all automatically gotten some trust from her because we're going to do the three things she absolutely wants. And when I say in our work together, what do you want to accomplish? I have included myself in the picture already. We are already working together. She has a trusted advisor right now. And then she says, well, you know, I would like to, uh, uh, you know, get this work done or, you know, have my smile or whatever. And then during this time, there's some under the question, under the radar questions that I ask that aren't the top 10, but they're under the radar. Um, I ask them uh, a couple of them. I say, well, you know, uh, uh, how, how long are you going to live? And I'll ask them that off the cuff. It'll just be like I'm writing something down like uh, what makes a good dentist and, and somewhere around there. What makes a good dentist? And they're telling me. And after they're done, I said, well, you know, how long are you going to live? And that takes them back and they'll say, you know, as long as the Lord lets me or, you know, my grandmother lived to be 94. And I think, oh, so, OK, well, you've got good genes, Leslie. I said, you know, if you're going to be 94 years old, are you going to have your teeth? And they always say, well, I plan to. And this is applied psychology. These are the breadcrumbs now. We're going down the line. And I said, well, if if you're going to keep your teeth, then let's make a plan. So when you're 94 years old, you have your teeth and you're as healthy as you can be with the least amount of problems. So right after that, I go into a a mini seven diagnostic disciplines uh, investigation. So I'll ask him, he said, do you have mercury fillings? Do you have plastic fillings? Do you have crowns? Do you have root canals? Do you have extractions? Are your wisdom teeth still there? Have you got any partial dentures? Do you have implants? Do you snore? Do you have a night guard, any sports guard? Have you had periodontal therapies? There's about 10 things I'm gonna go down the list, just check off, yes, no, yes, no, yes, no. First of all, it tells me what dentistry they've purchased in the past, but it covers every seven diagnostic discipline in a short amount of time so they know I've asked about snoring. They know I've asked about implants. They know I've asked about night guards. So when I get to the point when I say, you know, what would you like to accomplish? And they say, I want my teeth until I'm 94. And I said, we need to make a plan for that then, Leslie. Let me make sure of that. And then I will add 
all of those seven diagnostic pl disciplines into that. Uh, so they know we're going to take a look at snoring. We're going to take a look at uh, TMJ. We're going to take a look at um, implants. So the next question I ask after that is, are you, are you going to be interested in looking at short-term or long-term solutions? And if they've been consistent with their commitment to save their teeth, Till they're 94, they're going to say, "I'm going to be looking at long-term solutions." So if you can see, if you can see kind of how this is, is is snowballing and rolling a little bit to where the patient is kind of um, uh, convincing themselves because they understand now they've got some things wrong. Um, they've gone through all of the seven diagnostic disciplines really quick. I haven't diagnosed them yet, but they know I'm going to be looking at those things, and they've got a goal to keep their teeth in their, in their 94. Then I'm going to ask them, you know, what's, what's, um, let me see, what's, what's the next question? Um, oh, I do short term or long term. You interested in short term or long term? And there's short term things that have to be done. You know, you have to get this emergency done or that. But long term, you want them to commit to long term care. And that's what this question does. And so right after that, I ask them, you know, are you going to treat your gum disease? You know, if I've already seen the x-rays, we know the bone height and the quality and the quantity, or they want the mercury out or whatever it is, as are you going to creep your mercury fillings? And they say, no, I want to get those done. Um, but after that, I want to throw a, a monkey wrench into this. And again, this is just applied psychology. I, I ask them, what's going to get in the way of you successfully getting what you're telling me you want? Now, that's a difficult question to ask. The, the rhythm and that question, but it's written in the new patient grid. So you can say, Leslie, you know, what's going to get in your way of successfully getting what you're telling me you want? Now, it's not me diagnosing this anymore. They want their teeth. They're, they have already now committed to being 94 years old with the least amount of problems. So I asked them, you know, I want to know, is there money? Is there time? Is there, uh, what's going to get in the way of you getting this work done? But I asked the question, and what's going to get in your way and people don't want that to happen. People want to be successful of successfully getting what you're telling me you want. It's not about me anymore. This is about what the patient wants and desires. So it's no longer selling. Okay. So um, the other couple of questions at the end of it would be uh, if it's a short little treatment plan, that's fine. You know, does this seem like an effective plan to you, Leslie? And it's a couple of fillings and a, and a crown or something. And she might say, yes, if it's a bigger case, um, kind of have to bring them back for a return of uh, a review of findings kind of appointment. But the very last question, question number 10, is would you like to buy my treatment plan? <laughs> it's, not, it's not would you like to buy my treatment plan. It's like, you know, would you like some help implementing this as we go forward? And they say, yes, I'd like your help. So instead of selling those questions in a kind of a breadcrumb way, take you in maybe what, 10 minutes um, to, a, to a place where the patient now has been convinced that they need treatment in the long term uh, and they've been convinced by somebody that they like and trust already and that's themselves because they've said yes every step along the way. Some of the questions are designed for a yes answer too. So we take all those 10 questions and then you can, after that, you can go diagnose with the seven diagnostic disciplines. And at that point, I catch my breath here, Howard. At that point, you know, what if you do have a $14,000 case? Then you're still thinking, well, how do I sell that to the patient? But you don't have to sell it anymore. Um, there is what we used to call a case presentation is that those words bug me from the get go back to, to dental school because it was like we were supposed to memorize our treatment plan to present it to the patient to get them to come into the dental clinic. Well, you know, patients in the dental clinic uh, were there for a whole different reason case presentation to a person coming into the dental clinic for one reason. They wanted uh, inexpensive dental treatment, right? You wanted credits to graduate, you know? Uh, Long-term patient relations had nothing to do with it. You know, 
the, the patients wanted good, cheap dentistry. They weren't there for a relationship. You needed to graduate. You, you know, you didn't need it either. N there were no questions on the tests about this from the professors. So we never learned this in dental school. So I guess my thought is from the first of our conversations, where did you start going with this in the first part for whole body dentistry? It's like, you're, they, they, we'd never involve the patients in the conversation. If they didn't accept our treatment, they're out the door and you go on to the next person that needs the root canal or needs the RPD or anything else. They didn't get the care, they had to accept. And you didn't put much more thought into it out in, in private practice, it's absolutely critical for us. And just from what we talked about before, it's like, try to get them in the door, get them a patient, get them a profi, get them a this. And, and, the, and the national average of, uh, for new patient value is like 400 to $1,000 per patient. That's why you need 50 uh, to 100 patients every month. So it's, it's it $488 to, is the average new patient. $488. And the lifetime value of that new patient is the same as an orthodontic. So an ortho, a, a dentist new patient is 488, but the lifetime value of that will be about 6,500. The orthodontists, their new patient, 6,500, but the lifetime value of that is 24 months or less. Yeah, got it. <clears throat> and an easier sell too. So when, when somebody knows their teeth are crooked, they want them straight. But trying to get that to sell them uh, in a case presentation, I have turned the case presentation around instead of like um, what we taught, what we're taught in dental school and how to present the case. Um, I just I, I've just called it the proposal. So what we do is do we propose solutions to the patient's problems of which they've been well aware of during the, 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 the discovery of, you know, sleep apnea or broken teeth and all kinds of things. So the proposal is a whole different mindset than case presentation where you sit the patient down and go over your treatment plan. A case presentation is. Uh, the same in my mind as a proposal where um, you're, you're working with the patient and propose solutions to get them to be 94 years old with the least amount of problems. And then at the end of it, this is something, you know, we've got the last step of this, Howard, is called the agreement. Uh, the fifth step is called the agreement. We've got um, in the office, you've got to We've had we've had clients that say, hey, you know, I've got these big cases, but they disappear. They never complete. So one of the things that we have is um, three different agreements, not just financial arrangements. You know, you think about going up to the front desk, let's make financial arrangements. Well, before they get out of the operatory, I want them to agree on three different things personally for me. And those are this, because uh, I, I, maybe you've heard it as much as anybody, Howard, but, you know, no shows, cancellations, people aren't paying, people aren't showing up, all that. Well, before somebody gets out of the new patient appointment with me, I want them to agree on three different things. And one of them is this, I expect you to um, uh, uh, not cancel any appointments. If it's important enough to make the appointment, it's important enough for you to be here. So I request that you do not cancel appointments. That's number one. Number two, I expect you to uh, be on time for your appointments. I'm not gonna waste your time. If, you, if you've got an appointment at 10 minutes after 10, you're gonna be seen at 10 minutes after 10. Now you gotta live by that if you say it. You can't be one of, an office that is constantly running over. Uh, the third one is, I expect you to pay your dental bills promptly and in full. So with those three things, I have trained for, for well, well, well over a decade now, easily about 17 years maybe. I've trained my patients to don't cancel on me and don't no-show. I have trained them to show up on time for their appointments, and I've trained them to pay their bills. Um, that's a pretty good start. Um, and and, and we, some of our most recent clients uh, with the new patient grid, they say, oh, man, if I'd, I, I could, if I'd have had this five or 10 years ago, my whole office would be trained because the new patients coming in, they're trained by everybody else's office, and uh, there's more to the agreement than just that. But that's a hell of a start right there to start training your patients with those three um, ideas. So, well, you, well, you know, the, the one thing that um, L.D. Pankey started and and he started it in Kentucky was um, to slow down and do comprehensive dentistry. And there's been a lot of institutes like the Pankey Institute, the Dawson, 
um, Spear, Coice, um, all these institutes have one thing in common. They're trying to get you to slow down the new patient exam and be more thorough and be more comprehensive. And that just is the trunk that starts a tree of all these things. And so I, I want to go into more logistics of the new patient exam. Um, do you meet the patient in your private office and ask these 10 questions, or are you doing this in the operatory? I do it in the operatory. You're oh. doing the operatory? Yep. And have they been, um, at, and when you go in there, have they already done uh, radiographs and charting and periodontal probing or any of that? Talk, talk more about the logistics, because a lot of these kids, um, you know, someone calls up, it's a new patient, they schedule them for an hour, you know, they snap bite wings, they go in there. Uh, the hygienist does the cleaning, then they come in, and the whole thing's five minutes at the end. So go more into logistics of how you do a new patient exam. How much time do you schedule? What do you get done before you walk in there and start going through these 10 things? Well, so uh, all, the, all the administrative stuff is done on the first phone call. Uh, paperwork's been done. The uh, clinical assistant will go and get the patient out of the reception area, and the clinical assistant will intentionally bring them back to an operatory, but the, the clinical assistant will intentionally walk side by side with that patient. Because my, hall, my hallways are purposely a little wide because I want that, they're probably five or six feet wide rather than four feet. I want, the, I want, that, I want that patient to be taken care of very well. So the clinical assistant will walk side by side, bring them back. If they need radiographs, we get the radiographs. Uh, we get blood pressures, and we just do all those immediate things right there. So the radiographs are waiting for me when I come in, but no probings, no dentition charting, nothing going on at this time. I walk in, and this is very intentional too. The new patient is not introduced to me. I'm introduced to the new patient. And that's a huge mindset change right there. So it's not like, Leslie, this is Dr. Evans. And like, okay, everything can start now. I'm here. And it's not like that at all. When I go in and says, Dr. Evans, this is Leslie. And I'll shake her hand and say, you're at the dentist today. You know, and they'll chuckle or something. And they say, yeah, yeah I'm at the dentist today. I understand. And I say, how can I help, Leslie? And they're like, wait a minute. We're going to talk for a minute? You know, so pick up the pen and a cheat sheet. Don't pick it, leave the mirror and explore on the bracket tray. So Leslie, how can I help? What's going on? And they say, well, I'm here for cleaning. Or they say, you know, I found you online, which is like everybody's doing it this day. And I'm thinking about this. And then I go into the second question. So, so, so uh, what kind of dentist are you looking for? And it's just immediately. And it might just be one sentence answers, but I'm writing it down. I've got a cheat sheet on, on all 10 questions. And, and how are those under the radar questions that I've got about how old are you and, and, and are you going to keep your teeth at that time? Because the light bulbs start going off for these patients at that time. So I just go down those top 10 new patient questions, writing down the answers because that's the intel I need. Now, I, I kind of break it up this way. Those top 10 new patient questions take me seven minutes to 10 minutes to do. Some patients want to talk longer. That's fine. Um, the, the research has been that, and it's, this is kind of weird, is that happen, when a conversation happens, the more you're, you talk to someone, the more you're the person speaking, the more you like the other person. That's just, this is applied psychology. So if you let the patient talk to you, the more the new patient likes you. So you've got to bring that into the, in this applied psychology also. So you go down to the, the, the top 10 new questions and they walk out going down to schedule for their periodontal therapy or their cleaning or whatever, because they don't get that right away. Um, unless we have an opening right away. They walk down, said, said, I've never had anything like that in my life. And then we grab that and we try to get that on Google reviews and things like that. So uh, all of these are breadcrumbs that lead in, in, a, in a direction. So if the case is under $2,000, uh, we'll go ahead and, and review those uh, findings with them right there. Pretty simple. But if the case is $8,000, I want to have time to look that over. And a verbal script I'll, I'll say is, you know, listen, Leslie... Um, I can't tell you exactly what I, 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 I might uh, uh, put down on your plan uh, because, it, it, you know, if I don't know what I'm talking about, my recommendations aren't going to hold much value. 
Now, that's just a verbal script that I tell them and they say, OK, I understand that. I'll come back because I want something of value when um, when it's coming to my my dentist. Um, so I might be going off 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 uh, off the scale here a little bit, but bringing them in. I am introduced to the new patient. I go through the top 10 new patient questions as quick as seven to 10 minutes. For those reasons, the longer someone talks to me, the more they like me. At that point, I pick up my uh, camera and I photograph them because that's a very uh, safe place to be with uh, uh, photographs. And we take a series of nine photographs, you know, side and the clusal and all that. And then you're a talking set about of extra oral facial photographs. Extra, or sorry, extra extra oral. I want to see. I want to know who my patients are. We print that out so uh, I can. If I forget who a patient is, I just pull that out and I, I recognize their their face and their their dentistry. And then I ask permission to lean them back. Always, I ask for permission. I said, you know, Leslie. Um, uh, all these are good. I'm going to have them printed off right now. If it's okay, let me let me lean you back. Let's take a look. And they say, yeah, that'd be fine. I never, ever lean a person back by pushing the button without asking permission. So, you, you know, you, you, you push the button and all of a sudden they're going back. It's like, that's again, psychology. Anybody in a prone position is in submission and they just give, you tell them, raise your left leg. They're going to raise their left leg, right? I mean, they're, they're, but you ask permission to go back and then they say, I, I agree. I agree. And then you do a talk over and you go through perio and dentition and occlusal disease. You go through the seven diagnostic disciplines. You look at their tongue for macroglossia. You look for a small airway. You look for a, a, a large cricomental uh, space with the chin. Uh, you can go through the stop bang procedure for um, sleep apnea and obstructive sleep apnea, uh, TMD and all that. And then you, I take intraoral photographs too. And this probably takes a total of an hour per patient. But when the patient is not a $488 patient, when the patient is an $8,880 patient, uh, that extra time is well worth it because your your um, average new patient value has just doubled and tripled and quadrupled at that time. Um, so we like, and I'm, and this is this may not be for everybody because, like you know, all the homies that you've got coming in on Dental Town, some of them are are seeing 20, 30 new patients a day. And they're running it and they're running it and uh, they may be caught up with insurance and not being able to get out of it. Um, this just may hit home with somebody that says, um, I'd like to uh, work less time, see less patients, do better quality dentistry and have people thank you for it when you're done. Um, th those, those are the main reasons for it. Um, okay, I, I want to I stop you on a couple of points because I, I, I know how, how they think. I, I know what they're thinking. A lot of them are thinking, uh, yeah, you, you don't get it, though. I, I, I'm in a small town in Iowa. Um, you're, you're dealing with uh, a bunch of rich people out there in Williamsburg, Virginia. Um, do you think this is something that what you do applies more to rich people? Or do you, have you seen in your decades of doing this that um, it, it's, it depends on what they value, that if they – that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's depending on what they value. We've got people coming in here uh, that are carpenters, you know, and we got people that come in here dri dri dripping, <laughs> dripping in diamonds. You know, it, it really doesn't matter. Rich and poor doesn't matter. It's all about um, how they feel about their health. You know, you've got so many people buying organic and trying to get fit and healthy because uh, they've seen their parents go downhill. And uh, I, I tell you, uh, Donna up at the front desk, she gets calls every day on, wait a minute, this is a young family here. This is, this is a 27 year old with two young children and a dentist down the street was gonna put mercury fillings in my five year old and I didn't think that that was right. And now we know uh, European Union just this week or last week it was, they put out uh, by July of 2018, they're gonna completely ban mercury fillings from anybody under 15 years old. They're going to completely ban mercury fillings for pregnancy and uh, breastfeeding women. So uh, we've still got dentists across the country putting mercury and in kids. And the younger families are, they've been online. They, you know, they just want something different for their own families. 
Um, can, can I can I tell you what I why I thought think that band was uh, crazy? Why? <laughs> Seriously. Um, well, num- number one, <clears throat> mercury and amalgam is bond to silver, zinc, copper, and tin, and when it sets up, it's an insoluble salt. But these pregnant women are eating tuna fish. Yeah. When you when you and I were born, the ocean was one part per million of uh, mercury. Now yeah. it's four part per million yeah. from burning coal. And these countries that say that, they're still burning coal, and they're still eating um, um, fish big, and big fish, like tuna fish. Yeah. And when you look at, um, I have a friend who's a, uh, a toxicologist at U of A down here in Tucson. And when he starts talking about mercury, he, they, they did a bunch of studies of uh, um, premature uh, dead babies, uh, whether that be, you know, you figure out how that happened. And um, he, he says that the, the mercury toxicity um, is mostly in rich countries from eating seafood, believe it or not. So you have yeah. all these anti-mercury dentists um, who always have a tuna fish sandwich or a tuna on their salad or all that. And um, mer- mercury, um, and then the, um, when you go to the poor countries like China, where they burn uh, coal open without all these deals, they're getting a hundred times more mercury uh, from breathing their own air from burning coal. So it seems like, uh, but the, the, the one kiss of death that I thought was the final nail uh, for mercury is that the number one source of uh, mercury contamination from dentist is not the amalgam we're putting in the patient while they're alive. It's the, uh, I think it was something like um, 6% of the atmospheric mercury is from cremating humans yeah. who have amalgams in their teeth. And, at, and at the first stopgap thing they need to do is they need to start passing laws that you can't cremate anyone until some dentist, hygienist, somebody's got to get in there and extract those molars before you cremate it because that's just going right out the oven. I, I, I feel sorry for the guy who's standing there cremating people. So mer- mercury is a uh, wide spectrum of... Uh, but but why, why, why are you again against mercury filling? So. Uh, it's... I'm, my thought is that I've seen that research also with uh, cremations and, uh, you know, what four or five years ago, there was a multi-million uh, dollar apartment complex, I think it was Santa Clara, Santa Ana, California. They were going to build this multi-million dollar thing. A bunch of investors got together right next to a crematorium and uh, the city shut it down, said there's too much mercury coming off of these crematoriums. It's above what the standard is for, you know, the mercury per cubic meter, and they wouldn't let them build next door to it. But, you know, that gets out, that gets out, and people are getting afraid of mercury fillings, like it's going to, you know, it's going to cause autism, it's going to cause Parkinson's, it's going to, you know, that's, there's an extremist like, uh, Hal Huggins was part of that extremis- extremism, like 35 years ago. And then there's other dentists uh, that say, and there's not, absolutely nothing wrong with them. And the truth is probably somewhere in the, me- in the, me- in the middle. I just, don't, I just don't want to be the person that says, these are perfectly fine. Don't worry about them. It, they're sitting two inches away from your brain. It's a neurotoxin. Um, if you want to have them in your mouth for the next 55 years, you know, I've, I've, Williamsburg is becoming a more of a retirement community these days. And, and I've had people come in when they're 55 years old, retiring in Williamsburg, and I'll, I'll, I'll take them on as a new patient and I'll say, you know, this is what we need to do. And this looks like uh, you, you'd benefit from it. And they'd say, you know, you know, doc, don't worry about it. You know, I, I ain't going to live that long. So, you know, we'll move on to the next thing, you know. And then, and then now, 15 years later, you know, they're 70, 75 years old and they're, they promised me they'd be dead and they're not. And now I've got to fix them. So my point is that treating people with a, um, a chronic exposure to the mercury that's in their mouth may be a good thing, may be a bad thing. I don't know. But that's because we know that they've got mercury vapor analyzers out there. They know that when mercury vapors heat up, I mean, mercury films heat up, that mercury vapors come off. I've got to um, at least offer uh, a treatment plan that gives them the information, says you can keep them if you want to. Here's the risks. Here's the benefits. Uh, it's just like a big filling. You got a, you got a big composite resin that's 75, 85 percent of a tooth. 
uh, there's not much left to put a tooth uh, to f put a new filling in when that breaks. They need a crown. Uh, they have to know that these big fillings aren't going to last them for another 55 years. You know, if they're going to live to be 94, so it's it's an option that's open to them. And as part of just the the seven diagnostic disciplines, I'm going to tell them about sleep apnea. I'm going to tell them about any cosmetic concerns that they might have, any periodontal concerns that we've got. It's just part of all that whole body diagnosis and health. So it's part of just the bigger picture. I'm not one of those guys that says, you know, get your mercury fillings out, otherwise you're going to have Parkinson's in, in, in two years. Everybody's got uh, some kind of fuse lit. And I don't know, uh, when a new patient comes in, are you the person that's going to get breast cancer when you're 26? Or are you going to be sitting on the front porch smoking a cigar, drinking dickle and dickle sour mash when you're 95 and nothing's wrong with you, but you got a mouthful of mercury fillings. I don't know, but there, I know that some people's fuses are short and they may, they may be the person who is going to come down with, um, MS or something. And am yeah, I the, able the, the one, the one thing I always think about that when I hear a, a lot of the, uh, um, oral systemic health links and things like that. You know, some people jump the gun and say, uh, you know, oh, there's there's no research. There, there, that's correlation. That's not causal. There's nothing to prove that. But then I always stop and say, okay, well, what causes autism? What causes MS? And then so it's like, okay, well, if you don't know what causes it, how do you know what doesn't cause it? Because you you have to learn as a as a uh, human in 2017 that. A hundred years from now, there's going to be so much more data. A lot of what we are thinking today looks silly. I mean, that, that's that been the pattern for the last 5,000 years of, or 15,000 years of recorded human history. So um, before, you know, people always operate with knowing what they know, but they never yeah. stop and pause to think about what they could possibly not know. And the bottom line is we're going to live our whole life with incomplete data because the, you know, the, the final answer of explaining half of this stuff might not be for a thousand years. I mean, it could be two thousand years. Uh, you know, it's called the in science. It's called the precautionary principle, and that's it's, if you don't know, then then pretend like it does until you know different. So there's been all this talk about mercury fillings for thirty five years. Um, all this talk now about BPA in the composites, and it's like, okay, we just don't know. You know, there's. BPA, BPB, BPC, BPD, nobody knows what is better than the others. Um, they just know all this research coming out with BPA plastics in, in, in baby uh, drinking bottles, in the nipple of the plastic, the dripping bottles, and they know it's a, it's a, a hormone disrupting chemical, so that's close to your baby when they're just developing, and so, my gosh, what do you believe and, and in? What then, and then there's a whole other, where a lot of it's not even science, it's politics, like, um, um, you know, I've been involved in the uh, fluoridation campaign of Phoenix back in uh, 89, and then when it expired 20 years later and did it again. And what I was most amazed, I, I agreed with most of the anti-fluoridationists, because when I'm down there debating, most of the anti-fluoridationists, they just hate the government. They, they don't want the government doing anything. They, they don't, they, I mean, they're just, it, it was all anti-government. When you start talking about science, two things pop up with about one, um, the anti-fluoridation community is, they don't believe the CDC. They don't. They don't believe these institutions. They've lost faith in their institutions. That that's what the the uh, Democrats and Republicans have done in the last twenty years. They've run about a eleven percent approval rating, and they destroyed the trust in these institutions. And they 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 see this proliferation of big money lobbyists. And when these old guys were saying, "Well, I, I hate big government," I'm like, ah, "So do I." I mean, I, I, I get it. But I want to end on this. Our, that was a, our hour is up. That was a fast hour. But I want to go into overtime. And you were a founding member of the American Academy of Oral Systemic Health. Um, yes. t talk about that. Why were you a founding member? What is the Ac American Academy of Oral Systemic Health? Are you still a member? Uh, what, what's, what's that all about? Talk about that. Well, it's AOSH, a, a double A-O-S-H. Um, dot so org, not dot com, dot org. Dot org. A O S H dot org. Yep. And uh, a bunch of us just thought, you know, it's time to uh, take a look and see where the research is going. And it's uh, they rely on a lot of uh, science. 
uh, there were some good people starting up the academy, and so I joined. Was that Chris Cammer? Was was he the one Chris who started? Yes. Yeah. And his father started the American Academy of Cosmetic Dentistry. Yeah. He's in what Madison, Wisconsin. Yeah. I mean, who would have thought Madison, Wisconsin, would have started the AACD, and, and now the uh, the American yeah. Academy of Oral Stomach Health? The, the Cameron family has given a lot to dentistry. They have, and he's a character. We love him. Chris um, or Jack? Chris, I know. <laughs> so um, originally, we thought it would. It, originally, I thought there'd be a lot more of oral systemic health would be uh, more on the seven diagnostic disciplines kind of theme, but we have kind of uh, uh, just mainly gone after perio and the perio health and how it, uh, you know, with, with the inflammatory cytokines and everything that can happen there, we've kind of gravitated to be, that's mostly what we're interested in. But that's, if, I, if, if I've got anything to do with it, we might change that a little bit more. We just had a, a webinar with them last month that I presented the, uh, the new patient grid to them saying, you know, there's a lot more than just perio that we need to do about oral systemic health. But I think it's a good, uh, it, I think it's a good uh, society uh, academy to belong to uh, and we're growing and um, it's a lot of good people in it. I think it's, uh, I think it's known that a lot of uh, bigger conventions are having trouble putting people in the seats, putting butts in the seats these days because of, um, you know, webinars and, and podcasts and things like that. So uh, the future of the, of the academy, I don't know. So you, you don't know about the future of the academy? Or are they, are they having attendance problems? Well, I think everybody is across the board. But uh, I, I think if anybody's growing, uh, and I, I did not go to the, We just had our, our, our meeting, uh, and I did not go to this last meeting. But um, I don't know if we were full in attendance or we, we improved or not. But... Um, I think it's I think it's well worth uh, growing. I think dentistry for whole body health is 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 on the rise uh, across the country. Um, j just because of whatever, just because um, well, there's some other statistics. There's 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 a, a, a group of Americans uh, called LOHAS, L O H A S, Lifestyles of Health and Sustainability. Lifestyles of Health and Sustainability. And a few years ago, the New York Times wrote about it, says, this is the biggest market you've never heard of. <laughs> you know, it's that these are people who pay attention. It's mostly well-educated females uh, who make the buying decisions, as you well know, for family, food and health. Um, it says, this is the biggest market you've never heard of. It says, if you could just, and, and it's 30, no, it's probably 33% of the, of the American adult population right now. So you can Google L-O-H-A-S and if you could corner this market, you'd have a career in in helping uh, have a type of dentistry that would that would kind of blend with their lifestyle that way. So I think it's I think it's on the rise. There's whole, whole foods. Uh, oh, God, I don't know how many whole foods markets there are across the country, but they're growing. So all of this is going. And uh, I think the people that want to have a career that is more. Uh, satisfying personally and professionally i think that you know being just it's all about teeth and gums not so much anymore yeah and the other thing about um toys like a lot of people think i'm anti-toys are and it's um it's there's two things i see as a toy one um you know if, if you're buying a toy for a return on investment versus are you buying a toy to motivate because you know to the 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 cost of burnout, I mean, like you just quit dentistry at 50 or 55, as yeah. opposed to I know so many people that are loving it at 85. I was lecturing in L.A., and I swear to God, a 90-year-old man, he's the only living survivor that he knows of uh, from Auschwitz in Poland. Oh, wow. And he was 90, and he just bought a CBCT, and he just started learning how to place implants. And the oh. guy was the most energetic, hyper guy. And then I lost his name. You know, I was talking to these people after the seminar. I'm like, where is that Where is that little man? I mean, he's a real short guy. He was in L.A. And he's about, I don't know, 5'3". And I was running around because I so wanted to uh, um, talk further about him. But, um, you know, if buying a laser makes you, run, you know, run 20 red lights on the way to uh, uh, your dental office, you got to do it. And if you're sitting on a drill, fill, and bill um, amalgam machine and, and you, you burn out and you hate your job, then, then you can't do that. I mean, you can't do something you hate for money 
and do it long term or you'll be in depression, drugs, alcohol. I want to end on one note. I just want to say one thing that I've lectured in, in, in all the major cities in the United States probably 10 times each. And where you're from, Williamsburg, Virginia, that is one of the most hidden gems. So many people have not heard of that or been there, but um, it's got uh, cl people walking around and like they're George Washington and Abe Lincoln, and it, it, it's called Colonial. Talk, talk about Williams, Virginia, and where, where did that start? You're, you're a suburb of Washington, D.C., right? You're only like, how far now, are you from the capital? We're, we're, plenty, we're plenty far away from D.C. Well, how far? We're two hours, two and a half hours outside of D.C., uh, going south uh, uh, that way, southeast, I guess, yeah. Um, so... Williamsburg was the first, it was the colonial capital. Uh, and so uh, a lot of people met here. We've got, you know, King's Arms Tavern where, where uh, you know, Jefferson and, and John Adams, all these people were coming to town. Monticello is just up the road an hour, uh, Mount Vernon. Four presidents have come from Virginia, the most ever. Very conservative state. Uh, actually, it's not a state. It's the Commonwealth of Virginia is what it is. It's not a state. Um, Williamsburg uh, the colonial part of it was taken over by the Rockefellers back in like 1910 or something and kind of restored to be um, a historic thing. So they've kept it very, very 1700s kind of thing. And uh, people are dressed in costume all the time. Are those uh, employees or volunteers or uh, a mix? All of them are employees and they have their own stories. They, they, they are either uh, Mr. Jackson um, my father was, uh, my father retired from the Coast Guard and he, be he came to Colonial Williamsburg Foundation and he uh, was the director of architectural projects for Colonial Williamsburg. So I got to go in some of these uh, houses and we actually lived in the George Jackson house who was a merchant uh, in the 1700s. These people were, were, were in, that, in that time, these people were putting their fortunes and their lives on the line for independence, right? I mean. You could be killed <laughs> very easily. Um, and so they, they keep cobblestone streets. They, you can go down the back ways and, and get into the bottom uh, uh, kitchens where they still fire up big, huge kitchens. Um, and it's just been maintained. And Rockefeller's put it on the map. And uh, it's still... It's still uh, and, and what is the thing with rocking chairs? It's the only place left on earth that yeah. has rocking chairs in the lobbies, on the patios of the hotels. How many, I mean, do you agree or disagree that there's, how many rocking chairs are in that city? I couldn't even tell you, but if it's not authentic, if it's in the Colonial Foundation, Colonial Williamsburg Foundation, if it's not authentic, it is not gonna be there. As a matter of fact, uh, one of the houses right next to uh, the, uh, the uh, King's Arms Tavern was found to be like two inches off of its original foundation through excavation, things like that. They moved the whole damn thing two feet over because it is that authentic here. And it's really cool, you know? Oh, so, I, I love it. it. It's a cool place. In fact, Gordon um, Christian, um, yeah. the, the biggest name in dentistry when I got out of school forever to this day, and uh, he always did 12 cities at the same time. Like, he comes to Scottsdale every year in April. He does a ski resort in Utah every uh, January or February, but what his, his his top twelve? He always did Williams, Virginia, every year. Does he still do that? Yeah, in July he comes. Yeah, 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 every July. And uh, my gosh, it is just so cool. And I I love to walk around my four boys, and they're like, "Well, who's that?" And they're listening to some guy in full costume from seventeen hundreds, you know, yeah. ranting about it. It's just it's just really really cool. Yeah. I didn't know it was that far from D.C., though. It's two and a half hours from D.C.? It's out of D.C. It's on the peninsula, and uh, it's uh, kind of isolated between the York River and the James River, where Jamestown is, and Yorktown. And, you know, this is fabulous. You know, the, the, the Revolutionary War stopped in Yorktown, to, you know, 10 miles down the road. You got Jamestown, the first uh, per permanent settlement. And so, like, you're just living in all of this history. You can walk out in the forest, and you know... And how, how, many, how, many, how many did George Washington lead to their death? How many, how many died under George Washington? Was it 17,000? Oh, gosh. Uh, I don't know. I, I've been more of a Civil War buff than Revolutionary War. Well, the but, Civil War was almost a million. It was like, what, 890,000? Oh, in, 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 in App uh, not Appomattox, but in, in uh, Antietam, 24,000 men died with what, in 24 hours? Yeah. I mean, 
It's just crazy. And so many stuff. dentists think they have a hard job and they yeah, got all this burnout. And you think, of, well, you weren't one of the 17,000 boys that died under George Washington. You weren't one of the million, almost a million that died in the Civil War. And then after the Civil War, I mean, then you have a, I mean, we've had World War One, we've had a depression, we've had World War II, and you hear some of these dentists whine about how hard they got it. It's like, dude, you need to crack a history book open because I'm pretty sure there's a million Americans that would trade their life with yours any day of the week. Yeah. You know, but uh, hey, thank you so much for uh, coming on my show for an hour. Um, I, um, and uh, thanks for getting your MS, your DDS, your MAGD. Uh, I love your uh, entrepreneurism, and I hope the big takeaway from these kids is that uh, don't don't just drill, fill, and bill. Stop. Be more comprehensive. Have a relationship with your patient. Get to know your patient because uh, you started this off, and I want to end it on this. What you started off with the care credit, and care credit is 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 an example. The the Fortune 500 they're not interested in new patients. I mean, 95 percent of all the dentists have used care credit before. So they're into loyalty programs, educating their, their customers, trying to get you to use it more. Where a lot of dentists just, their whole career, all they want is new patients. And I look at it as a coffee cup. I mean, they got one hygienist and two chairs, and they've been pouring 20 to 30 new patients a month into this coffee cup. And their one hygienist and two chairs to the dentist doesn't change after 10 years, 20 years, 30 years. 40 years, yeah. and you come up to this old man, and he's 75 years old. He's been in a town of 5,000 for 50 years, burning through 30 new patients a month. And I'm like, dude, you've just been pouring stuff into a coffee cup with old patients flowing out for 50 years. When do you want to slow down and try to keep some customers for life? When do you yeah. want to uh, quit focusing on new patients and online marketing and Facebook and start focusing on a relationship? Reduce staff turnover, communicate, you know, go through these 10 questions. Can I say one more thing, Howard? Heck, Based heck yeah. on that, there's three ways that you grow the practice that I know of. First of all, get more new patients. Second one is get patients to come in more often and get patients to spend more when they come in. Now, the, the, the young guys out there that think that, that, that getting new patients is the only way to grow a practice is, 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 is dreadfully limited when you can use something like the new patient grid that says have patients come back more often and have them spend more money increase your transaction frequency and increase your transaction value that's a way to grow a practice they're missing two out of the three ways of growing the practice and you gotta just like you said you gotta slow down just a little bit to get that relationship never got it in dental school you can get it when you're out uh and if, if you just uh, focus on a little bit more on behavioral sciences, applied psychology, and learn a little bit more about that. But but look at airlines. By, by the time you're a 30-year-old millennial, you've flown every airline. So the airlines aren't looking for new customers. They're like, how can I keep you on America with a loyalty program or Southwest? or Same thing with credit cards. I mean, you look at every credit card commercial, they're not looking for a new patient. They're looking at a rewards program, you know, keep the chase card, and who's that Samuel L. Jackson on all those commercials, and, you know, all the Fortune 500, they're, they spend more money on loyalty yeah. than trying to get a new patient. And dentists just spend, you know, when we got out of school, no one advertised. And then within a decade or so, it was about 3% of collection went to advertising. After 20 years, all the experts are saying spend 5% on advertising. Now some are saying 7%. Really, you want to have 7% overhead bigger than your supply bill, which yeah. would be 6%. Just to catch a bunch of new people that you're going to burn and churn through as opposed yeah. to slowing down and seeing how you can keep this person coming in 5, 10, 20 years. I remember during the 2008 crash, everybody was saying, well, how are you surviving? It's like, dude, I opened up in 1987. My new patients are babies from patients that were babies in 87. I mean, uh, you know, just uh, coming back. But uh, thank you again for coming on the show. And uh, Zach, thanks for uh, doing this. And uh, have a rocking great day. My pleasure.